there are numerous strategies to safely spend your money in retirement. I've already covered one of the most well-known strategies in my video on the 4% rule, and we'll briefly touch on it again since I know a lot of you weren't around back then when I originally made the video. And since it's so popular, it's also a strategy against which most others are measured, so it's good to have in mind. But it is by no means the only strategy that's been put out there. And depending on how deep down the rabbit hole you want to go, it may or may not even be the best one for you personally. Today I'm going to be going over four strategies to safely spend your money in retirement. Hopefully along the way, we'll find one that appeals to you and your situation. Let's get started. But before we get going, be sure to like this video if you haven't already, as it really does help out the channel a lot, and subscribe with notifications on for more money-related videos like this one every single week. So the first and arguably most popular retirement withdrawal strategy that I want to talk about is the 4% rule, or the safe withdrawal strategy, which basically aims to get you to withdraw a certain percentage of your nest egg in the first year of retirement and adjust those withdrawals every year thereafter for inflation. A bright side to this strategy is that, so long as you stick to a conservative enough withdrawal rate, you should have a reasonable chance of not outliving your money, as I covered in detail on my video on whether or not the 4% rule is actually safe. Another plus to using this strategy is that your buying power will remain the same throughout your entire retirement. Say that John had annual expenses totaling $40,000 a year heading into retirement, and he was going to follow the 4% rule for his withdrawals. This would mean that he would have to have a nest egg of at least $1 million by the time he retires. Over the course of his first year of retirement, he would withdraw that $40,000. In his second year, he would account for inflation, or just increase those withdrawals by 2% every year if you don't know what inflation actually is, which is what many people do when they try to simulate this strategy for the future. But say that inflation was 3% in John's first year of retirement. That would mean in his second year he would withdraw $41,200. This keeps his effective buying power the same as it was in his first year. This can go the other way, of course, if inflation is actually negative over the course of a year. Which doesn't happen often, I'll admit, but it does happen once in a while. So let's say if inflation was actually down 2% in John's second year of retirement. If he was still adjusting for inflation, that would mean that he would lower his withdrawal in his third year of retirement from $41,200 to about $40,400. In terms of how this strategy is graded using the four factors of retirement, which if you don't know are income, risk, stability, and buying power, I've got a whole video on them in the description if you want to learn more. In my personal opinion, the 4% rule is below average in income. Dynamic strategies that focus on this factor as their primary selling point are far better better in this regard than the 4% rule. It's roughly average to maybe slightly below average in risk, though using the 3% rule can improve this score, and it's strong in both stability and buying power thanks to its constant adjustments for inflation and its lack of freezes or reductions. The second retirement withdrawal strategy that I'm going to cover today is the fixed dollar withdrawal strategy. This is exactly what it sounds like. You begin by withdrawing a certain dollar amount from your nest egg every single month and keep withdrawing that amount throughout your retirement. So if John had been living on this strategy in retirement, he still has a million dollars saved and still wants to live on $40,000 a year, but this time there's no adjustments for inflation. He withdraws $40,000 in his first year of retirement, $40,000 in the second, and so on and so forth. When it comes to the four factors of retirement compared to the 4% rule, this strategy is generally a little stronger on the income and risk side of things, while suffering a little more in the stability and buying power categories. The reason for this is that as long as your initial withdrawals are not too high, you're very unlikely to outlive your money on this strategy. And you may be able to live at a higher standard of living, at least initially, than you otherwise would have under something like the 4% rule. In fact, going all the way back to 1950, if John had had his $1 million invested in something like the S&P 500, he would not actually outlive his money during any of the possible 20, 30, 40, or 50 year retirements between 1950 and 2018, as long as he withdrew no more than $54,000 a year. So as I said, this is initially going to improve his standard of living compared to the $40,000 a year that he would have as his income under the 4% rule though eventually the inflation would catch up with him. So in terms of the four factors, the fixed dollar strategy is again above average in income and risk, but below average in stability and buying power. A third retirement withdrawal strategy is known as the fixed percentage method, 
This works very similar to the fixed dollar method, except that you're withdrawing a certain percentage of your nest egg every year. It also doesn't adjust for inflation, but it does at least adjust with the value of your portfolio, so sometimes that makes up for it. Say if John wanted to withdraw 4% of his investments each year in retirement. Since the value of his investments were $1 million when he retired, he would withdraw $40,000 in the first year of his retirement, leaving him with $960,000 left over. If his investments grew by 10% that year, the value of his portfolio would be somewhere in the neighborhood of $1,056,000 at the start of his second year of retirement. And he would withdraw 4% of that, or $42,240. The downside is that the reverse can also happen. Say that John's investments fell by 20% the next year bringing the value of his nest egg down to about $811,000 and forcing him to withdraw $32,440 in the third year of his retirement, because he still only takes 4% of his nest egg. As you can imagine, stability is something that this strategy has a very low score in, given that the value of a nest egg, especially if it's invested in something volatile like stocks, can grow or shrink by 20, 30, or even 40% over the course of a couple of years. The bright side is that, assuming you're not withdrawing something crazy like 20% of your nest egg every year, your risk of running out of money is theoretically very low. And I specifically say theoretically because, like many other things, it's true only to a point. If we take it to a logical extreme, this can break down. Say if John had $10,000 and he wanted to live on 50% of his nest egg each year for the next five years. He'd technically be fine in theory, but how many of us are going to be able to live on $5,000 a year? Not very many. But if you're willing to take the hit to the stability of your income in retirement, you probably can safely squeeze out a little more than 4% of your nest egg each year in a typical retirement. It just means that over time, your average raw dollar income will likely shrink. To illustrate this, let's say that John withdrew 10% of his nest egg each year. If he had a million dollars in his nest egg to start, he would start out with a six-figure income. However, if he ended up living longer than he planned, he could be living on what could only be generously described as a shoestring budget in his later years. For example, in the simulations I ran covering the various retirement lengths starting from 1950, assuming John had invested in the S&P 500, he would have had a median monthly income of about $6,500 in all 20 and 30 year retirements. But that number dropped quite a bit as the retirements got longer. For example, if he had been in retirement for 50 years, his average median monthly income was about $4,400. Which admittedly may not sound bad. $4,400 a month is still more than $40,000 a year, which is what you'd be getting in the traditional 4% safe withdrawal rate strategy. But you also need to consider his final few years of that 50-year retirement which on average allowed John to have about $2,300 a month to play with, which is considerably less than the 4% rule allows and considerably less than the six-figure income he started with. Also remember that $2,300 a month, possibly as many as 50 years down the road, is not the same as $2,300 a month today. Once we adjust for inflation over that time period, it may not even buy John what $1,000 a month would buy him today depending on how far down the road we are, of course. So buying power could be taking a significant hit if the initial percentages you're withdrawing are set too high. So in summation, the fixed percentage method scores reasonably well, though not necessarily elite when it comes to income, particularly early in retirement. It scores pretty well in terms of risk, assuming you aren't too aggressive with your withdrawals, but not very good with stability due to the fluctuations of the value of your nest egg, and is below average in terms of buying power. Unless you become too aggressive with your withdrawals, in which case it can get pretty darn bad in this category over time. The fourth retirement withdrawal strategy we'll be covering today is the dividend method. The dividend method seeks to get you to a point where the dividends from your investments cover all your expenses. The plus side to being able to use the dividend growth investing method is obvious. When done right, you don't have to sell any of your shares to cover your bills. The downside is that you are usually less likely to experience the kind of rapid stock appreciation we sometimes get during market booms if the majority or even entirety of your portfolio 
is invested in these higher paying dividend stocks. This is because companies that are in what investors call the growth phase of business usually want to reinvest as much of their profits as they can into continuing to build their business. And as a result, they don't usually pay out a large portion of their profits in dividends. And often, though admittedly not always, when a company starts paying a dividend, it's because they feel the biggest part of their rapid growth phase has ended. That doesn't mean that they won't continue to grow as a company, it just likely won't be quite as quick of a growth as it was in the past. Or at least that's what executives are expecting. But that's not really the point of this method. We're not quite as concerned with the stock prices rising or falling because we aren't selling our stocks in the first place. The point of this method is to minimize risk as much as possible by investing in well-established companies that are paying out consistent, and hopefully growing, dividends that will cover your expenses. As a result, the dividend method scores pretty darn high in the risk factor, is generally slightly below average in income, and both stability and buying power varies a bit depending on how your portfolio is constructed. In normal circumstances, I'd say stability is decent, though not excellent. Dividends do tend to grow over time, but there is going to be instances where they get cut down, particularly during market crashes. However, since they tend to grow more than they'd shrink, I'd usually consider it a net positive. But again, this does depend to a certain degree on which investments you choose. And again, under normal circumstances, I'd say that buying power is good, since dividend growth investments usually do keep up with inflation, or at the very least, very close to it. But again, it depends on what investments you choose. So those are four strategies to safely spend your retirement nest egg. But they're by no means the only ones out there, and depending on your situation, they may not even be the ideal ones for you to use. Next week, I'll be going over four more retirement withdrawal strategies that are a bit more dynamic in nature, and they may appeal to some of you better if none of the strategies today exactly jumped out at you. But that's next week. In the meantime, if you want to learn more about achieving financial independence, you can check out my videos on the four factors of retirement and the ten levels of financial independence with the links on the screen. And as always, thanks for watching.